Magic Mike Show, where you hear the experts speak. The Magic Mike Show, tune into the show every week. The Magic Mike Show, you can trust the show is the bomb because it's being brought to you by RacingDudes.com. What's up, everybody? I'm Magic. And I'm Mike. And this is the Magic Mike Show, episode 537. Mr. It's a big old Florida Derby. Huzzah! Love it, baby. One of the biggest days of the year at Goldstream Park. I don't know if you can say this, probably not on par as Pegasus, because Pegasus is just, you've got two grade ones and one that's almost, uh, that's on its way to a grade one. But the Florida Derby headlining an all stakes sequence here, a really great betting card overall. I think there's plenty of chances to make some money. Sometimes you might have to press your opinions, but I'm really excited about this card. Yeah, fun card. Um only a couple races where I have like horses I would consider singling, which makes it interesting when doing these pickaxe sequences. You got to decide where you want to go deep, where you want to go short. And this late, late sequence specifically that we're doing, I, I was kind of in a conundrum. We're going to talk about the pick fives that we have at the end of the show and kind of how we got there. But I don't know about you, Magic. For me, it was how do I make this a valuable sequence at all? And, and the way to do that was to kind of uh, go short in races. I think people can go longer in, try and take a couple shots against some favorites and uh, and see if we can find a way to structure it so that we are in a situation where if we do get home, it, it pays out because you're going to have Ways and Means who's a short price. You're going to have Fierceness who's a short price in the last. You got to decide how can I structure this so I, I end up you know, not spending $81, $108, $144, and it returns 72 bucks or whatever it is if it does chalk out. So that to me was one of the, the more difficult parts of this because a couple of the returners too, not completely sure what to do with it. Like we'll talk about ways and means. Interesting horse in this spot. Not sure what to expect from him. Well, I know what you could definitely expect from Knightsbridge if you saw race six at Gulfstream earlier today. A horse that Mike and I really thought we were going to get in the Fantasy League in the first round. Um, absolutely dominated. We haven't seen him since his uh, dominating debut at Churchill last fall, but I don't know if you got a chance to watch for this mm -hmm. show. Knightsbridge was just uber impressive, and he beat the piss out of those horses, including Sea Streak, who's, you know, stakes placed a, a decent stakes horse for, you know, one turn races, and he just left him in the dust. Yeah, a little too late to get it going, though. I mean, what, what are you going to do? You maybe go the Chad Brown route? Run it, uh, run that horse back. Or the, I'm sorry, the, the D-Wayne Lucas bout? Run it back real fast in the in the Lexington and see what happens? Nah, dude, if it was D-Wayne, he'd run him in the bluegrass. We're not waiting for the Lexington. We're going bluegrass. Got to get those points. So it's uh, Pat Day Mile is the next stop for that horse. If, uh, if things went well today and he comes out of it, that's where they're probably going to go is Pat Day Mile. I think you go Pat Day Mile, Jim Dandy, and you aim for the Traverse. He's a half brother to Speaker's Corner. Looks like he could just run all day. Um, so yeah, aim for the Traverse. At this point, the Triple Crown is not really a realistic option. So Dennis says he thinks it's a Belmont horse. I think going from the Pat Day Mile to the Belmont for your third career starts a bit of a tall ask. Everybody's a Belmont horse. That's that's the that's the <laughs> way. Like the late bloomers are the ones that don't show the talent quick enough. They're all Belmont horses. I, I, I wish that were the case. And we get like twelve in the Belmont every year, but we never get twelve in the Belmont. Yeah. Uh, Aaron says, uh, "Merry Christmas, uh, Happy Opening Day for baseball." And yeah, the dude who bet daily, his best bet was Orioles minus one and a half. He got him at plus money. And uh, yeah, they're absolutely destroying the LA Angels of Anaheim in the state of California. I like that look, Aaron. I gave out uh, Orioles minus a half run, first five minus 120 on Lombardi line this morning. So that was uh, one of my opening day bets as well. Back the Orioles. I've got the uh, the Royals plus 110. That one's still out. Those are my two opening day bets. Uh, you know, putting the toes back in the water here. Not uh, not going <laughs> to dive in fully. Not don't have a, a 10 game slate like we did some days in the summer last year. We got a little a little couple other things going on. Still some hockey. We still got some <laughs> some college basketball that's yet to be decided. So, uh, but it's it's a busy busy week I and mean, we talked about this on bar line like this weekend is phenomenal from a sports betting perspective because you get like yeah the first two weekends of the tournament chalked out but the matchups we get because of it are amazing and then when you look at it like the 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 baseball kicking off like it's great to have baseball back and have some daytime betting options if you want to get involved there and then hockey and, and nba closing out we're only 10 games away from the playoffs in both those sports so great time of the year don't mind not having football right now. Once we get to like June, I'll be complaining. But right now, I'm totally okay with it. Yeah, once the NHL and NBA playoffs are complete and we have champions, then it's like, okay, how much longer till football? I can tell mm -hmm. you, you only have to wait till Saturday if you want to see my boy J.P. Sears make his pitching debut. First half, first five, I said first half, first five A's when J.P. Sears pitches is, is a, a pretty good time. Is he still on the A's? 
He's still on the A's, yeah. Oh wow. Nobody nobody, nobody traded for him. Listen, they're all gonna wish they had. They're gonna wish they yeah. had that lefty JP Sears. I like I like that look too. Our Reds, baby. Let's go. Let's go. Got over 82 and a half wins this year. We need some Reds wins. So let's uh let's get her done. Get them stack them up early there. so we don't have to worry about them late. <laughs> they're off to a good start so far as well. Oh, listen, we'll get into some horse racing now. We've got the late pick five at Goldstream Park on Saturday, March 30th. All stakes ending in the Florida Derby. Let's get into it. Right is up. Berg says, uh, happy opening day. Go Tigers. Let's hope the Tigers can finish the season better than the Red Wings can. That's uh, I'm ready for that season to just be over so I don't have to see them slip anymore. But speed of horse racing, here we go. First leg of the Goldstream Park, late pick five, Saturday, March 30th. Race 10 is the grade three Orchid. Seven older fillies and mares routing a mile and a half on the turf. Note that the number three, R. Cali Kim, has scratched. And you have a single here, Mike. I do. I This was, this was probably... One of those, this is one of the races I went back and forth like three times. I mean, like you can make a pretty convincing argument for four horses in here, three based on talent, one based on pace. Um, and I, the one is a wild card. First time in the US here, Clement uh, signing Rosario aboard. The pace is a little bit of a wild card. Tower Bridge definitely going to go, but for how long is the big question there? Uh, you've got McCula coming back from a uh, from a layoff. You've got surprisingly, do we think she can get a mile and a half magic? Because that's a big question in my mind. Uh, I, I end up singing Lukulik here. Look, I, the six horse, Chad Brown, Ira Ortiz, look, a, everything kind of fits well. And when I'm looking at this, I went, I got down to the four and six. I think those are the best two horses in this spot. And to me, the mile and a half distance was the was the separator here. I think McCulloch sits a, a beautiful trip here. Should be closer to pace than surprisingly in this spot. Tower Bridge going to set the lead. I think McCulloch gets first run. I don't think anyone gets to him. I, I or it gets to her. I think this just sets up a little bit too well for. Her. And I ended up playing a $36 ticket. It's a dollar ticket versus the 50 cent ticket. And I, I'm not going crazy. And because of that, I need to go thin here. Like I, I can't play a dollar ticket and use the one, four, six. I can't play a dollar ticket and even really use the four, six in my mind. I have to make a decision and take a stand in this race. And as, as much as I am scared that surprisingly is going to be a really good Philly or mayor uh, this season. I'm just not sure the mile and a half distance is right for her. So I'm singling McKeelick to start this thing off. Uh, Charles B really likes it as well. I used her. I went three deep here and actually used the other two horses that you talked about there, but I did use Mikulik as well. Uh, initially I thought I was going to try and beat her in this spot, because if you look back the previous seasonal debuts, both were, you know, she was second and then fifth, but she was beaten by th two and three quarters, three and a quarter in those spots. But then you look at the date and that's Kentucky Derby weekend when she was <laughs> making those seasonal debuts. Like that's everybody's targeting those races. Like that's, you know, you've got Keelan in the, the a couple weeks beforehand, but otherwise everybody is building their whole winter and spring campaign to that weekend where it's like a mini championship for all the divisions. So she was facing much uh, harder horses there than what she's going to theoretically face here. Uh, so I'm willing to forgive her for not being fresh off the bench. She did win her debut at Saratoga as a two-year-old, so she has that going for her. And then, yeah, scratch off the Breeders' Cup Philly Mare Turf. She was last right out the gate and just that's you look at her past performances she does not like to be last early she's not the chad brown sister charlie come from the clouds kind of closer so uh good pick there i went with the four surprisingly on top i watched back the pegasus philly mare turf where she just missed beating didia by a neck and that was the first time with todd pletcher first time uh after not racing since saratoga she's got a lot of class and I like that about her for this spot. I, she has the ability, I think, to go the mile and a half. She hasn't been tested that far, but the breeding says that she should be able to handle it by mastery out of an arch mare. So there's a lot of distance foundation, especially from the dam side. Uh, I am surprised, not surprised that surprisingly he's back because they paid a million dollars for her. I'm surprised McCulloch came back for her five-year-old campaign because she really doesn't have a whole lot left to prove, I think, other than trying to, she got, yeah, she had the grade one win as a three-year-old. So a, a ton of value in the breeding shed if they wanted to to sell her that but no McHugh looks back here and I think that's another reason you got to use her 
Yeah, it tells you just how good she must be doing because you don't, if, if there's any doubt at all, you don't bring her back here because she's got a grade one. She's earned over a million and a half dollars. She's done everything that she can do in her career. She's won at multiple distances, both short and long. I like the fact that we're starting a mile and a half. You mentioned that she wasn't wonderful off the bench. Those two starts off the bench were at a mile and an eighth and a mile and 16th, uh, which I don't think are her best distances. I think she wants to go longer than that. And, and I, that's what we're doing today right out of the gate here. Surprisingly, it is the horse that I'm most concerned about. Um, the first effort for the Pletcher Barn was phenomenal. I mean, there's no like other way to say it. It was a phenomenal race from Surprisingly, who just missed to a horse that has been very, very good over the last year in Didia. I just, again, it's a distance for me. That was really all it was. It's just that I'm just not sure that she can handle the mile and a half distance. And I'm, I get a horse in McCulloch who can definitely handle the mile and a half distance and has done it well in her career. So for me, it was that was the reason I went with the six over the four. Now, you did go three deep and you're using the three I mentioned, but I did mention four horses. I mentioned oh. the one, La <laughs> Mahana, and the two Tower Bridge as well. Uh, you went with the two Tower Bridge at 30 to one. Talk about it. I did. Yeah, I'm excited about this one to see what she can do on turf. If you watch her last race, uh, so second time on synthetic, the first race scratched off because she did not have an, a good start and just lost all of her chance there. But if you watch the last one, it's a mile, both mile and quarter races, so I'm not worried about the mile and a half distance here. She looked good in that mile and a quarter win, but it was weird. She got out to the lead. She got comfortable. And as they were entering the far turn, the favorite who'd been kind of tracking and pressing her just suddenly went and took another horse with her. She fell back to third. And then if you're watching the race on replay, you know that she's going to win. But I'm like, how did she do this? Corrales didn't panic the jockey. He waited until he saw those front two start to slow down, kicked her out three wide, and just absolutely powered past to drive home. She also finished that final quarter in 24 and a half seconds. That was the fastest final quarter of that entire field. The horses that finished second and third came from last and second to last. Two horses that were pressing her early that thought it was a good idea to pass her when they did, they fell off to be fifth and seventh, beaten, uh, I think, over nine lengths, each of them. So a very impressive race. But then I look at this. She's never tried turf. But who's the leader if it's not the two-tower bridge? We cannot expect that the French horse on the rail making her North American debut is going to come charging out of the gate uh, ready to spit fire. Tower Bridge just worked 47 and one on the Turfway Park synthetic course as their final work for this. So I think that she's got a lot of speed and she's got the staying power to go the mile and a half. The question is, is she good enough? To me, this felt a little bit like when Pletcher put Alpha Bella in the La Prevoyana on Pegasus undercard. She was lone speed. She'd never tried it before, but trying something new at a price. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and use this horse as well. Yeah, I, there is no doubt Tower Bridge is making the lead. I, I like 100% agree with that part of the handicap. I, it, the question is, can she get the distance? And she's a, a younger four-year-old versus a bunch of older horses, right? So is she going to be fully developed to be able to hold off some stakes-level horses here? Uh, it was stepping up in class. That last race at, at Turfway Park was awesome. It was phenomenal. Go back and watch if you hadn't. She, she looked very, very good and drew off impressively. So I agree with you. I don't think the mile and a half distance is going to be a problem. I actually really like Johnny V on this horse. If you like, if I have a list of like jockeys that are sneaky good on speed horses that like don't ask them but still make sure you get the lead so you're not really you really using any horse johnny v is like at the top of that list some of the rides he's had in the triple crown and on authentic and the breeders cup to be able to make the lead without using and control the pace is just has been phenomenal and i, I expect you're going to see a very similar ride here from tower bridge i'm just worried it's a bit a little too big up step up in class i also don't think you're getting 30 to 1 I, I mean, I'm. I, I think you'll get every bit of double digits. Don't get me wrong. I, yeah. The thirty to one though is a little bit, little bit out there. Yeah, I agree. Our Cali Kim. Uh, I don't have, know what her morning line was going to be, but she would have been a very short price here, probably based off what we're seeing. She would have been the fourth choice there, but or maybe even third, because there's a big drop off. You've got three horses that are within, you know, two to one, five to two, eight to five. You've got Anatolian at eight to one, who was getting soundly beaten by R. Kelly Kim in her last two races. So you know R. Kelly Kim would have been taking money in the spot. I'm actually glad she scratched because then I'd be four deep in here, and I, guys, I'd absolutely use R. Kelly Kim. So I'm glad she scratched. She was so impressive last time out. She was so good. Like I and I don't know what I would have done here if she was in this race. I'm not sure what I would have ended up doing. Yeah. What do you like? So we're not, neither of us using the one. La yep. Mahan, Mahana, Mahana, yeah, Mahana, La Mahana. Uh, I just don't really trust Rosario from the rail from Clement and a first time French horse coming over on Gulfstream Parks turf where you got to be somewhat close to be able to be relevant in this race. Was that your same reasoning or did you chuck for a different reason? 
Yeah, it's all those reasons. Plus, if you look at her form overseas, she doesn't, you know, hasn't strung together two solid races back to back. Um, her races when she was first starting, like, a, so she ran as a two year old once, came back on the turf and ran seventh, and then broke her maiden next out. And you look at her four year old campaign, she's fifth, beaten almost two lengths, came back in a different race, was eighth, beaten 14 lengths, and then went one. So she's not the horse that comes over from France and you go, yeah, that's absolutely going to be a world beater. I also, her time form ratings overseas compared to the rest of this field actually put her right in the middle of the pack. So I'm going to pass on her for those reasons. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I'm surprised uh, to, I mean, I get, okay. I am, I disagree with the two to one morning line, but I'm not surprised it's there. Is that a fair way to put it? Like, yes, you see this horse and you're like, okay, it's a European horse coming over two to one. Okay, fine. That makes sense. I, I wouldn't bet this horse a two to one. I would need more like four or five to one if I was going to get involved here. Uh, yeah. To, four times stakes winner in France. All four of those wins were going at least this far. But yeah, it's just we'll we'll let them go ahead and beat us with uh, with the one La Mahana. Not much. Mo- What's the Ohana? That's what means family. I was trying to think of the Lilo and Stitch line. All right. Second leg of the late pick five at Gulfstream Park, Saturday, March 30th. Race 11 is the grade two Gulfstream Park Oaks. You got a field of nine three-year-old fillies going a mile and a 16th on the dirt. Where'd you go on top in this Kentucky Oaks prep? Oh, I went to the six gun song here. Um, this is a horse that I just think has been really impressive in four starts, gotten a little bit better each time. Lost to Leslie's Rose two back. That was the one loss. You kind of like scratch your head a little bit. You're like, ah, really? But uh, I, I thought I actually ran a pretty good race there, Doug, and was just kind of beat. Went out to a mile last time, uh, easily dusted that field at a mile. Now we're jumping up to Stakes Company for the first time. This horse has tactical speed, but doesn't need the lead. I love that in these type of races. Uh, the mile of 16 shouldn't be any problem at all. Gun, gun runner out of a Mr. Greeley mare. Um, I, and I want a horse that's forwardly placed in this race as well. There is quite a bit of speed, but it's not like scary speed to me. It's like speed that's going to make sure there's a reasonable pace, but not go nuts with it. Um, and I look, I don't love a lot of these horses. That to me was the other <laughs> big problem here. It's like I was going through it and I'm like, okay, yeah, into Champagne. Okay, you're good. Fine. Fiona, Fiona's Magic. Okay. Yeah, you're okay. Do gooder. All right, that was a terrible time but okay you weren't bad you know and then i look at ways and means and that to me was the the big question uh this was a hyped horse like beyond hyped horse at saratoga last year she breaks her maiden easy she comes back we singled against her and beat her that was a nice little i think it was a seven thousand dollar pick five cash with silent bombs we beat her now she's back here in this spot and you'd expect to step forward but it's also first time off a layoff I'm not really sure what trip she tries to make for herself here. Um, it just it, it was tough to find horses that I was really excited about. And so Gunsong kind of uh, landed as my top pick in the spot. Yeah, this is my top pick as well. I've actually been w- watching this horse very closely since that Leslie's Rose race. And uh, I had picked her to finish second in that spot. And I thought it, with the breeding, as you mentioned, if she stretches out, you should see her succeed. Uh, I was able to cash on her at eight to five when she had that win going the mile over sea lines. I really like, by the way, that Hennig didn't go follow Leslie's Rose into the Devona Dale stakes last out. He said, let's get some more confidence in her. And also the Devona Dale seven furlongs, she wanted a mile and won very impressively. And so, um, yeah, I'm with you on the six. So we have agreement there. We're going to diverge from this point on, but that's okay. I'm going to use the number five into Champagne as my second choice. I think she gets a better pace set up than she had last time out. Uh, in the Devona Dale, when Fiona's Magic was able to just go out there and, and kind of do her own thing early and had enough left that she was able to hold off into Champagne. But I thought into Champagne ran a very great race there. Um, I think she's going to get a really nice pocket trip. I think the two goes, I think the eight goes, and I think into Champagne can sit right behind him, try to get first run and keep the six kind of behind her a little bit as well. Um, but six might also be a part of that. So she's got tactical speed. Don't mind this Le Peru riding for Ian Wilkes because he's got two wins and a very close to being a third win over her. So uh, I used the five. Why did you leave her off? Uh, I thought the Devona Dale wasn't very good. And so I kind of chucked everybody who was in that race. Uh, you go back, you look at the final time. Not great. Went 111 to six furlongs, 137 to the mile. So 20, what is that? 26 seconds there. The final two furlongs. That's pretty bad. Um, and I just was not impressed with anyone. When you watch it back, it seemed like everyone was tired. They were kind of just grinding at the end of that race. And now we're adding another 16th of a mile. 
uh, it, to me, it was just one of those races where like I, if someone out of this race beats me, totally fine. That's why I'm not using Fiona's Magic. It's not why I'm using Into Champagne. And I, I was assuming you would use Into Champagne. I know you've liked this horse quite a bit in the, the last mm-hmm. couple shows that we've done. Uh, but for me, the, the five was just... I like. I don't want anyone out of that Devona Dale. I want to find new shooters here, and I was I was more interested in horses like the one and the two than I was and the nine, to be honest, than I was the the five or the eight. Uh, I did. I'll I'll keep going, and then I'll throw it back to you because I did use the two as well. Do gooder. Uh, the sloppy time. I know it was uh slow coming home to break her maiden, but she also dominated those horses. Um, it was a field of seven, so it wasn't like a, a super small group that she was beating up on. She also set off just a little bit early and was able to get home uh, in the end there. It's, it's a big step up going from your maiden to a first-time winner's first time without Lasix, and now she's going to have to also try and go two turns. But getting the bright price on a horse that I think, you know, being drawn inside like this, the one's not going to go. You know that. The three doesn't belong let alone isn't going to go so the, the, i think she has a chance with that early run up to the first turn that she's going to be loose early and with castellano riding for antonucci it's not just archangelo they win with the 29 percent winners in the last year um so i'm going to use do gooder here i think that she definitely has a chance to at least outrun her odds and if she turns for home still on the front end i'm going to be at least be excited about her potentially cashing yeah, I like this pick. Uh, I, I went too deep in this race. If I went three deep, Do Gooder would have made the ticket. Um, and, and it's for all the points you said, look, I think Do Gooder is 100% in the lead here. You break him from the two post, you have the most speed. She's got to go. So Castellano has to just send mile 16th on a big day at Gulfstream Park. T- speed's going to be good. And, you know, Charles just mentioned it. They, expect the dirt track to be cranked up for early speed. I agree. That's what we've seen from these the, from Gulfstream Park on these bigger type days. I don't see a world where she doesn't make the lead. That makes her really dangerous in this spot. Um, now, I do think there's other horses that press, and we'll see how much pressure they put on her and what that does. Yes, yeah. it's a step up. You know, first time two turns, first time stakes company. I agree with all those points, but the price is right to take a shot at this horse. So uh, I would have used the two had it made the ticket. I went too deep. I used the four as the other one, Ways and Means. Here's coming back for Chad Brown. Uh, I read Ortiz Rides. This setup's the right. Look, we, we mentioned Do Gooder. Gun Song's going to be on the other lead. Fiona's Magic wants to show pace. Ways and means should get the trip that that she wants in this spot. Should be able to sit in fifth, sixth spot, save ground on the first turn because she's breaking out of that four post and be able to to make a move. So I ended up four six here. If I did go three deep, I would have gone two four six. The nine was actually my fourth horse. I'm taking a shot against the four here. I it's gonna be she's gonna be a short price, right? You know that maiden win at Saratoga on debut was so impressive, but 209 day layoff. She's gonna try routing for the first time, and I look at her breeding and I think. Practical joke, they can go farther than a mile, but especially with Warriors Reward underneath, I'm a little worried that she's a sprinter miler. So I'm not, it, it, the price really is what honestly scared me off of her here. And I understand why she's eight to five and she'll be lower than that, deservedly so. But for this particular situation, I'm trying to take a shot against her. Uh, don't blame you. If the field was better, I would have agreed with you. Yeah, that is also, also key. So neither of us are playing Fiona's Magic. I think for me, it's a case where, She's going to have to clear a whole bunch of horses to try and get over. And if she does clear all those horses to get over, it's either because they all fell down or she had to burn a lot of energy. So that was for me. I think she's not going to get the trip she got at all in Devona Dale. And you said you're just chucking everybody from that race. Yeah, I'm chucking the whole Devona Dale. I I agree with you. She doesn't get that same trip. Um, If she does, she probably loses. She needs to get better than she was on that trip. She looked exhausted at the end of that race. um, And she had into champagne chasing her and not really anybody else. So uh, for me, that that was just a a pretty easy pass there. The eight post is is brutal. Last time she drew the two post, that helped her get out. This time, she's going to have to deal with the horse in the two post do-gooder, who is going to be faster than her early. So... I'm not sure how Fiona's magic is able to replicate that last trip. And then if you go back and say, okay, well, can she win from off the pace? The answer is pretty much no, she's never done it. So uh, <laughs> right. it, it's a pretty easy one for me to just be like, all right, we're going to chuck her out. Um, the one that we, we haven't really talked about, the nine scalable, I think is a little bit interesting. It's a Pletcher Rapoli horse. Uh, Jose takes the mount. Uh, this, she was in the forward gal and was the favorite in the forward gal. I just didn't really run that well that day after a a convincing win in a maiden special weight, but that was just with four horses. I think there's more upside here. I don't necessarily think this is the day, but she's a horse I think makes sense underneath. Underneath, yes. Yeah, I wouldn't play her to win. She's just, she's so pace dependent that unless you think this thing is going to absolutely collapse into her lap, I don't see it happening. And if it does collapse, I'm with you in the sense that the four is going to be the one that picks up the pieces. 
Uh, third leg of the late pick five at Gulfstream Park on Saturday, March 30th. Race 12 is the Sand Spring Stakes. We've got a field of nine older fillies and mares. It'll be going a mile and 16th on the turf course. Make note that the four Jan's girl is an early scratch. I have a single, but where'd you go on top? Ooh, you do. Did you single the eight? I did single the eight. I don't, I don't hate it. Um, <laughs> I, I went with the seven on top, right to the inside. Infinite Diamond here. Uh, this is a horse that's not really run much on the turf. We saw two turf efforts at Del Mar. One of them was a uh, optional allowance. The other a grade one, the, the Del Mar Oaks there. Uh, then comes back next start on the turf, tries the Honey Fox last time out. I actually thought that Honey Fox race was a very good race. She was 40 to one that day, 41 to one. Um, broke out of the 10 post, 10 out of 11, and never even saw the rail, let alone was able to run next to it. So the trip was absolutely brutal for Infinite Diamond in that spot. I think Infinite Diamond gets a much better trip out of the seven post. I like the fact that Paco rides back. Uh, the horse has very, like the turf races that we do have on the page make it good enough to run with this field and the price is right at eight to one. So I, I put the seven infinite diamond on top. I never know what to do with Patrick B and cone horses. I He's usually tough, almost man. always pass on them because it's like she runs. Uh, let's see. She, she, she debuts as a two year old in June. She gets second beaten three lengths, seven to two odds. Then she's five to two at Del Mar. She's fourth. And then she goes two to five at Goldstream, And then she wins by 14 and a half. And then she's absolutely nothing in a grade one. And then she wins the stakes at Gulfstream. And then she's fourth beaten a mile, sixth beaten a mile. And we don't see her for a while. She's just, she is like, I'm willing to let Bean Cone beat me all, so often because so often the horses do like what this horse's form says is that, hey, she pops and then she has a whole string of, of nothing. So yep. if you're going to use her, you're getting good price on her. You've got that going for you. I just couldn't, I looked at her. I was like, can I make a case for her? I couldn't do it, but I know that you did. And that's a really off of that note. It was hard for me to make a strong case for anyone outside of the eight. I didn't go into this thinking I would single her. And I kept looking at every horse going, can I make a case for you? <sighs> not really. I can make his, eh, not really. So uh, market segmentation won this race last year. She won three straight stakes. She won last year, won the grade one New York. She dom uh, returned from a three month layoff to dominate allowance horses over this course and distance in the past. And remember, she scratched out of the Tampa stakes earlier this month that we were covering. Uh, I think it was Tampa Bay Derby Day. She scratched out of that spot. She runs here instead. So I singled her. I think she wins this in hand. I, I kept looking at this going that maybe the one is who I would use if I had to go too deep here. But I don't want to use the seven to five probably going to be odds on favorite when they break and then also use the second or third choice here at five to one. So I'm just going to single the eight. Okay. I mean, look, I, I've liked the eight too. Eight's my second pick. So I'm not going to try and talk you off single in the eight. Uh, I, I did go three deep here. I went seven, eight, nine. Um, so I used the nine fastest flight as the other horse. I think the nine gets the lead. And I think the nine gets the lead rather easily in this spot. Um, I, I, there's not a ton of pace to the inside of the nine. And so if the nine can clear, all of a sudden, you've got a situation where the nine could get comfortable up front. And, and that was the main reason why I wanted the nine at 10 to one. You're switching to the Drexler barn. He's 24% when switching over from a different barn. So first time with trainer, 24%. We've seen speed before from this horse, and the horse almost hold on in a couple spots. Uh, you've seen some stakes level, level efforts before. We're dropping three pounds. A uh, nice little break here as well. I, it, to me, it's one of those spots where I'm willing to take a shot at a horse that I think gets to the front. And you look at like, the other main speed competitors here, Beechnut Trophy has some speed to the outside. Market segmentation actually has gone gate to wire, but that was in New York in a seven horse field and they went 50 to the half. That ain't happening. Um, Infinite Diamond actually could be the speed if the seven decides to go. You've got the three horses possible speed, but again, that's in longer races where you're seeing like 114 and 51 halves. Like th there's just not a lot of actual speed in this race. And the nine horse to me is the one who is most likely to set the pace. And if, if we've seen it on Gulfstream turf, if you can get the lead, you become really, really dangerous. And this nine horse has races that are good enough to be able to compete with this group if he's able to inherit that lead. So I, I ended up going seven, eight, nine here. Uh, don't hate the nine pick for you're going to get a good price on it as well. Um, it's I have had a feeling just handicapping this that the three is going to get sent at her last two races. I know it's a lot slower than what we'll see at Gulfstream usually, but um, it's, Safi Joseph has three horses in here. Two of them have the same owner, the three and the one, and the one definitely needs pace to chase. So I feel like the three is in here to try and really create um, a pace demand that, you, that you're not seeing necessarily on paper. Otherwise, you're right. Fastest flight looks like she could get out there early and get going. The uh, There was one horse I was looking at. They just got purchased. Yeah, the, the nine uh, was purchased out of that last race. She went to the Phasic Tiffin uh, February sale. 
out of the Suwannee River and they bought her and they said, all right, $105,000 down. We're sending her right to this stakes race in our first start for Marty Drexler, the trainer. So I, I appreciate it. I can understand it. You're going to tend to want a horse that they thought was worth $105,000 to keep racing uh, before she becomes a broodmare. So don't, yeah, don't, let shy says, don't hate it, but I do single the eight. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, th this is the problem with this sequence, and this is why my ticket is so weird. I rarely will play a dollar ticket that costs thirty six dollars, but like this could totally start six four eight, right? Like this sequence, and then you're staring, and there's two races left, and you're you've got fierceness in the last one. Where if you're using that horse, you're like you're guaranteeing four chalks in the sequence. So that's it's it's a very odd sequence if you you don't have anywhere you're trying to beat anybody. Yeah. Well, speaking of odd sequences, the penultimate leg of the Lapic Five Saturday, March 30th at Gulfstream Park, race 13. It's the Appleton Stakes, and this one gave me the most headaches here. 11 older males going a mile and a 16th on the turf course. I, I ended up going six deep, because partly because <laughs> I could afford to ticket-wise, partly because I was like, I there's a lot of horses in here that I like, and not not too many that I dislike. Where'd you go on top I went with the three horse, Ice Chocolate on top. Uh, this horse has been really good since coming down to Gulfstream. The last two races, one in January, one in March, uh, the two efforts returning from Woodbine after running up there three times. The allowance, the 62 optimal allowance, was a, a phenomenal allowance. So Ice Chocolate wins that race. JP Hellish ran second. Headline News ran third. Both of them came back to run well in stakes races. Jumps up uh, into the grade three Canadian turf. Emmanuel wins that race. Siege of Boston runs second. Ice Chocolate runs third. That, I thought, was also a very good race, considering that we broke out of the nine post in that one and the ten post in the race prior to it. Now we're breaking out of the three. Should save significantly more ground. We get Paco up from Saez. A uh, little bit of a downgrade there, but not too much of a downgrade in this spot. The horse loves Gulfstream. One for three. Loves the distance. Two for six. Uh, the price is right at nine to two. And what is it? You're right. A very, very competitive event here. Um, and you get, like... This is one of those races where there is a lot of speed to chase. The two is going to go. The four is going to go. The five has a chance to go. Like there are a lot of different horses that are going to go early, and it sets up well for a horse like 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 Ice Chocolate to sit right behind them and be able to swoop at the wire. So you used two horses in your ticket. Both of them are on mine, which is good because I won six deep. That's fifty five percent of the field. So I'm glad to see that uh, we've got agreement there, and we agree on the same top pick. I, this is a little surprising for me, but I'll take it. Uh, I had Ice Chocolate on my ticket for the Grade 3 Canadian because I'd said, this horse doesn't run two-turn turf races very often, but when he does, it's pretty darn good, especially when he's not having to face Casa Creed. So uh, I think if you had Emmanuel in this race, he's 3-5. to five. I think if Siege of Boston is in this race, he's probably 4-5 to five even money. That, by the way, much better pace set up in here for a Siege of Boston than the last race he was in. Kind of a shame he's not going to make the trip. But yeah, we agree on Ice Chocolate a lot as the top pick here uh we'll talk about your other pick here and then i'll give out mine in a little bit but you like the number five never surprised as well talk about i i do like never surprised i mentioned the, all the speed like never surprised has shown the ability to sit behind horses then be able to make a move that last race uh after almost a full two-year layoff comes back so the son of constitution for todd pletcher i read ortiz picks up the mount here uh, I thought it was really, really good last time out. Considering how long we were off the layoff and everything that that, that had this horse set up against it, was able to sit off the pace, just a good, just sat essentially too wide around the first turn, sitting in second, made the lead at one point, ended up getting nosed out by Quality G, who's also in this race. But now we're getting second off that long layoff, and this is a horse where Pletcher wanted to keep it out, keep keep running it. Um, it, to me, he's got a big chance to take a step forward here. We know he likes Gulfstream. He's run, run over this turf course five times, one uh, win, two th or three thirds there, including the Pegasus uh, World Cup Invitational. Ran second to Curl and Liam that day at a, at a you know three to one, a pretty short number. You think about what that version of Colonel Liam would be in a race like this, and it's uh, yeah, it would be one to nine if you got that ver version of Colonel Liam. It feels like Never Surprise doesn't need the lead. And of the speed horses, he's the one I don't think needs it. So I ended up going 3-5 here to try and get through. It's crazy that he's had three stakes wins, but none of them graded. If he wins this, it's just going to be excuse me, another ungraded stakes win. You have to respect the hell out of a horse that in 11 starts has hit the exact in 10 of them. However, my concern is that other than his debut when he went six furlongs, the only time he went uh, one turn really, he hasn't won without getting the lead. And uh, I almost left him off initially because I looked back at the only other time I read's ridden him. That was the grade three kittens joy to start off his three-year-old campaign. He's now six. So he's been around for a while. Chess's dream. I, Chess's dream. Yeah, but he took back. 
I yep. ran took him back in a six horse field. He was one to five in Chess's dream beat him by two lengths. I'm a little concerned that he is a need the lead type based off of the way his wins have gone. That if he doesn't have that lead to himself, he's not going to necessarily get the job done. And that one time I read was aboard, he pulled him back. And I'm kind of looking at this going, if I see I read pull him back, I am going to be so pissed off about it if I'm a better because this horse just is a free runner up front. But we'll see what happens. Maybe he has that ability and just has never been asked. I mean, I, neither of us are playing the two, so we don't have to worry about him. You know, he can sit off or just be up there with the two. If he if he pulls this horse way back, though, it's I can't see a world where never surprise gets the job done. I mean, it feels like the two and the four go, right? Like that they're they're the ones who rush up into that turn. And the, the idea is the five should be able to sit right back. And either the one shows some speed and the one gets the pocket trip or the one and the five run in tandem right behind the two and the four. Either way, you should get a really good trip out of this five force, assuming you don't go suicidal for the lead and end up three wide on the first turn. <laughs> That's not usually something I read does. No, no, he's pretty good about not not getting involved in the suicide paces. Uh, we're talking about him. So I'll talk about him now. The four big Everest is on my ticket. Last time out, it, to me, is why I'm going to use him in the Artie Schiller stakes. He showed he could rate off the pace and still get the job done. And that was a big deal to me. Um, by the way, beat exact estimate in that race. Exact estimates ran two absolute bangers on the local synth after that. Should have won on Pegasus World Cup undercard and then uh, did get the win on the synth last time out. So uh, to me, it's a good horse that he beat there. Uh, I used the nine smoke and tea. Shoddy brought it up in the chat. This is a multiple stakes winner needed a race off the bench last out, I'm hoping, because he did not look very good. But it's been a while since he'd been to the races. He is a five-year-old, so maybe just needed to knock some of the rust off. Our top pick in this race, Ice Chocolat, was third. So not a horrible horse to be losing to. And this horse, I think, loves to stalk and pounce. You have the two, the four are going to go if the five goes as well. This horse, I think, is going to sit right behind him a little bit. So smoke and tea on. Uh, I did use the seven lucky score, kind of a hunch play for me. This, the only time this horse has ever run a two-turn race, it was the Breeders' Cup Mile. What a hell of a way to go. All right, we're going to try two turns. Let's go to the Breeders' Cup Mile. Only missed third by a length and a half. And it had some, I don't think it was ever going to make the top two or top three, but was running well and just got slammed into some traffic and midway through the stretch and had to hit the brakes. But... The breeding says a mile, two turns are well within his grasp, and he is grade one placed. He you know, was missed second by a neck behind Master of the Seas last year. Master of the Seas, winner of the Breeders' Cup mile last year. So uh, smoke and tea, lucky score, big Everest. Before I talk about my last one, any thoughts on those three? Uh, like the idea on, on smoke and tea, I had that one considered. Uh, lucky score I didn't look at, but now that you mention it, I think it makes a little bit more sense. So I might have to go back and look at that one a little more, bit more. Uh, big Everest was a pass for me because of the price and the running style. Makes sense. And, and again, if it wasn't for his last win in the Artie Schiller, we sat two lengths off early in third and got the win. I, I would probably wouldn't be using Big Everest here. Uh, last one for me, I did use the uh, other Pletcher in here, Quality G, who beat Never Surprised last out. This horse just loves to win. He's got three wins, a second by a neck, and then second by two lengths in his last five starts here. Um, it, this is a big class hike, right? Because he was facing starter allowance and then N1X, N2X allowance company. But it's an ungraded stakes. There is no Emmanuel in here. There's no Siege of Boston in here, especially if you think the four big Everest is going to be speed and kind of quit in here. Quality G is going to come running. He's going to be flying late. I don't hate that it's Le Peru riding him because Le Peru to me is good at two things. Walking the dog on the front end in a five horse turf marathon, turf route, or coming from the clouds on a closer. So I've got him on a, a horse coming from the clouds. It's closing. And the fact that he nosed out never surprised and then now never surprises five to one and he's 12 to one to me. That's at least saying there's some value on quality G. Yeah. I mean, I think I agree with the prices in the morning line though, because never surprises coming off that long layoff. And to me, that yep. kind of separates the two. I am surprised you're not using the one uh, County final who would have been the next horse up for me. I think County, I think the one has a big shot in this race. Um, if you look at that race, specifically the last one, was able to come from off it on the synthetic, beat exact estimate of horse we talked about, face fly the W, and missed me and Mr. C two back, who are two like phenomenal horses on that Skullstream synthetic. I, I kind of like the trip that we're going to get from County Final here. That would have been the one I would have used if I went three deep. I We're not on synthetic is my answer <laughs> for County Final. I, I looked at him. Uh, he's going to be coming from off of it a little bit, but 
his turf wins is a sprint at uh, Kentucky Downs, a sprint at Colonial Downs, and then way back when he first debuted uh, as a two-year-old at Churchill Downs sprinting. So yep. I, it's weird. He's by Oxbow out of a tap at Mary. You would think running long is what he would do well at, and it took a long time to get there. By the way, $475,000 purchase, and I saw that, and I was like, but it wasn't what? by these people. Yeah. I look, and I went, oh. Oh, West Point. Yeah, this is a West Point horse. We're going to overpay a horse by about eight to 10 times its worth and then lose it for an $80,000 claiming tag. So, yeah, Sounds makes sense. About right. a, a decent horse. I just didn't want to use without the synthetic. I get it. I, I the, the, It should be just as good on the turf. We'll see if it actually can make those turf, those synthetic races into a turf race to tomorrow or Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> uh we'll move on the fifth and final leg the one that everybody is most excited about here uh saturday march 30th at gulfstream park race 14 the curlin florida derby presented by hillendale farms at jalapa this grade one race has 11 three-year-old colts and gellings going a mile and an eighth on the dirt you've got hades you've got fierceness and then conquest warrior and then after that you're getting double digits on whichever horse you like who are you going on top with i put fierceness on top um Look, everyone, the, the Holy Bull is just this horrible race. The Holy Bull is still the third highest out, next out buyer, or last out buyer for, for fierceness. So it's not that bad, guys. It wasn't that bad. Now, obviously going to need to run a lot better to be able to win again. And the tempo post is less than ideal here. Uh, I think it's, what, two for 51 on the meet right now at the tempo. post. Um, the, the big question here is, like, what fierceness is going to show up? Because are we going to get the fierceness on debut? Are we going to get the fierceness from the Breeders' Cup? Or are we going to get the fierceness we saw last time and we saw at Aqueduct in the awful effort? I think we're going to get the good fierceness on Saturday. I really do. And, and Pletcher talked about how this has been the goal for this horse the entire campaign, that they were targeting this race to get fierceness to be 100%, to take a step forward into the Derby, that the last one was really just a get one underneath them type thing. I just... I. I don't love this crop. I've been talking about it for a while. And when you go through this race, and I'm trying to make cases for horses like Grandmo the first in this spot and Ladem Bro, it kind of tells you how I feel about the crop. Um, and it's one of the main reasons why Fierceness ended up on top here. If I didn't pick Fierceness, I'm not sure who I really... Well, I, I know who I would have picked in the long run, but <laughs> I wouldn't have been overly confident in it. And I have no interest in Hades at all. At all. Not even a little bit. If Hades wins, I lose. And I am totally okay with that. Do it again because, it, especially at seven to two, I have no interest in attending the funeral. That's fine. I did not fierceness, I, but it is as as Chris Mello says, to fierceness or to not to fierceness is the true question here. Um, and God, it was the post. It, I I did kind of a live reaction to the post that's up on our YouTube channel to the post draw, I should say. And as soon as I saw ten, I was like, that's like that's bad. This horse, bad. he won his debut, went right to the lead. He won the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, was pressing on the lead. The Champagne, he did not get the lead. The Holy Bull did not have a good break, did not go to the lead. Once he got on the lead, it was he just used up too much already. Um, if he was breaking from post two, I would absolutely be using Fierceness in here. But I'm not going to use him because he's from post ten. That's just that's too much. And he's, he's a little guy. I remember the Holy Bull watching him <laughs> battle in the stretch with Hades. And it's like Hades is big brother, fierceness is little brother. And you're like, one of these is a two-year-old champion, and it's not the horse that's winning right now. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to pass on fierceness. But if he follows his pattern of great race, horrible race, great race, horrible race, uh, eight to five is going to feel like a dream on him here. I went with Conquest Warrior on top, though, the nine horse, three to one. Winner of two straight, equally impressive both times. Last out came over the course and distance. Shook specifically said, he went to that race with the horse because he wanted to make sure a mile and an eighth was something he could do because he was looking at the Florida Derby. That's great. Shug was looking at it. Shug likes it. I'm going to ride with Shuggy Bear. The only time this horse lost, it was when Al Cappy debuted and it freaked so hard that he hasn't been seen since then. But um, Conquest Warrior within the neck of that for his debut, seven furlongs. So I use Conquest Warrior. Did you also use him? I did use him. He's uh, he was my third horse in, last horse on the ticket for me. I, the last race was really good. Going to need to take a step forward to win this race. Um, and, and there wasn't much in that race. That's the other thing. I mean, Merritt was would be the other horse that came out of that, and he'd be beaten by five. And I'm not sure anyone really thinks Merritt's all that good. Um, so for me, I thought that the nine made sense. Obviously, the ten makes sense. I'm gonna go for a bomb here. Um, 
Shadi just called it out too. Bail us out, baby. Give me give me the three horse here. Fifteen to one for Pletcher. Irad decides to land here, uh, which I thought was an interesting choice. Um, but Bail us out is a horse that ran well on debut or ran okay on debut against Born Noble. Um, then comes back and looked absolutely awesome. That was a mile and sixteenth. It was over synthetic. It wasn't on on dirt, but it's a looking at lucky out of a Giants Causeway mare. Shouldn't have any issues with the dirt. I don't think it's a it's it's, it's a problem there. I think we may have even just tried to find a race that was two turns to try and get Bayless out into before sending him out into this spot here. Uh, I thought it was a really nice effort second out. I think it's interesting that Jose Ortiz wrote it, and now it's I read. Uh, kind of tells you since you always talk about how they have the same jockey agent tells you what, mm-hmm. uh, what Jose probably said about that horse. that it's a good one here um, and has some tactical speed. It's not a horse. that's going to have to come from the clouds to be able to win. I uh, was able to sit just two lengths off a 47 and four opening half mile. They came home and sub sixes that day. I, I, I thought that last race, yes, it was over synthet- synthetic was a very, very good race. And if I'm looking for a horse to kind of upset the apple cart here, and I don't want Hades, who's going to try and go gate to wire here. And, you know, you've got Conquest Warrior and Fierceness who have sort of proven what they are. Uh, to me, you look at for someone who's taking a big step up and has a chance to take a big step forward, and the three bail us out fits both those. I don't hate it. My concern is trying to figure out which one of the bail us out. Like, okay, for his debut, you can be willing for a horse to not – uh, to not win and, and born noble just absolutely freaked, but he was 11 to one. <laughs> like he had a Todd Pletcher horse debuting uh, that was 11 to one there. And that to me is like, that's not, I mean, that's dead cold on the board for a Todd Pletcher at Gulfstream park. And then was even money out of that race at, at Gulfstream park on the synthetic, I, you know, 15 to one, you're getting the good price on him. I couldn't pull the trigger on him, but I understand the case to be made for this source here. I want I'm going to, I'm going to pull up that. I want to say that there was a uh well born noble i'm sure was a huge favorite is that what I, you're trying to look for i think that was a pretty competitive race too so oh no born I'm noble one. was six to five big city yep. was second he still hasn't broken the maiden bonus move was six to five he broke his maiden next out on the turf yeah you got three next and out winners turf. one of them on the turf yeah 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 i mean three next out winners that's not i mean born noble's yeah, and- a goofy son of a bitch, but he should be a next out winner. He should have been a next out winner. Yeah, and there were two yeah. Pletchers, the bail, bail us out who Jose rode, and then Irad rose that rode Born Noble, who's the favorite. Yeah, I, I mean, it's one of those situations where I would assume Born Noble took all the Pletcher money, and that didn't leave much for the other. That's fair. Uh, next up for me, I did use Hades, the two horse here. Uh, listen, he's undefeated in three starts. He looked fierceness in the eye and laughed and said, you're the two-year-old champ, and then took off. Domestic product was second in that race. It wasn't a beautiful edition of the Tampa Bay Derby, but he got the win there. So a good form there. He's beaten up on fierceness. I love the post draw for him. If he wants to try and go gate to wire, go for it. If he wants to sit off of it like he did in his maiden debut, go for it. So Hades makes the ticket for me. But also, if you're using Conquest Warrior and you're using fierceness, you cannot also use Hades at seven to two. I understand that. Yeah, you kind of need to make your decision there, and I'm I'm just willing to go against Hades here. Like I'm willing to say, okay, do it again, especially at seven to two versus the nine to one price you got last time. The most impressive uh, three year old male we've seen at Gulfstream, uh, I guess, in a stakes race because I think Conquest Warriors last one was pretty damn impressive. <laughs> Doorknock winning the Fountain of Youth is probably the most impressive, right? Which between that, the Holy Bull, and the Mucho Macho Man. Ladon Bro gave Doorknock hell every step of the way and still fought on and was able to save second over Frankie's Empire after he couldn't keep up with the goofy dummy that Doorknock is. I'm going to use Ladon Bro because I think he, if Fierceness breaks clean and decides to go, Ladon Bro is going to give him more hell. Edwin Gonzalez's first time riding the horse was last out. He made the decision to go after Doorknock and when the horse broke well and just keep after him. He's bred by Mucho Macho Man out of Pegasus Windmere. So the distance, the added distance, the extra 16th of a mile shouldn't be an issue. But this is just a really interesting horse to me that I think is going to, it, it, I was kind of looking like you were for a horse that can really upset things at a price. Bail us out is not where I went. I went with the speed horse Ladam Bro here, the number six. Uh, yeah, I don't hate it. The question of what, what Hayes is going to do. I, I thought Ladam Bro was going to be the main press here for Hades and we'll see if that that comes to fruition or not uh if that's the case I think it makes it tough for him if it's fierceness I think Ladon Bro ends up in a pretty good spot we'll see if he can run him down turn it for home 
It's weird that I have to specify. Chris Milo says, I have a hard disagree on Dornock's win being the most impressive. I said the most impressive three-year-old mill stakes on dirt. Several caveats there because that's the only way you could call that, I think, impressive what Dornock did. <laughs> unless unless he wins the Derby, in which case we're going to sit here and go, man, remember when he did that and was just goofing around? It doesn't feel like it's that way, though. I mean, we talked about the Florida circuit last year and people were down on it. And we I, like we kept making excuses for why the Florida Derby and why the Fountain of Youth were better than they were. It sure doesn't feel like that so far this no. year. Like, I, I don't really I'm not sitting here making excuses for those first two races. We'll see what the Florida Derby has. But uh, those first two left something to be desired. Yeah, yeah. Name, name a more impressive three old mill stakes on dirt winner. Go mm-hmm. ahead. That's the problem. Is like that is the most impressive. It's not. Yeah, well, like could, Mike said, this the, is not. Could the most impressive three year old male stakes winner who ran on dirt be First World War? <laughs> I was waiting for that. Uh, he he should have won if he was that impressive on dirt. He should have won the stupid Mucho. Uh, his most impressive race was on turf. He should have just won the Jeff Ruby stakes, but they didn't send him. Unbelievable. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for this episode of the Magic Mike Show. Thanks for joining Mike and I to talk about the late pick five on Saturday, March 30th at Gulfstream Park. Florida Derby Day. We'll give it our tickets one last time, and then we'll get you out of here. I'm going for 50 cents. I'll do 246 with 256 with 8 with 345679 with 269. That's $81, and you have a super press ticket that's also super affordable. Yeah, I'm going to play a $36 ticket. Uh, it's a $1 base. We're going to go with 6 with 4 6 with 7 8 9 with 3 5 with 3 9 10 Again, for a dollar, that'll cost you 36 bucks. Boom, 36 bucks for that one. Uh, still licking the chops after uh, licking the wounds after the near miss last week on the the dollar Bayou Bluegrass pick five, which uh, we were so close to hitting for or, uh, over $8,700. So hopefully... We- we can both hit this one. I know we have agreement and some agreement in every single leg. If you're looking to play the entire 14 race card at Gulfstream Park on Saturday, head over to RacingDudes.com. We have the pre-sale going right now for the betting Bible for the Florida Derby. It, if you weren't aware of this, last week, the Louisiana Derby betting Bible, a what was it, 330% ROI. Jared alone cashed for almost $900. With his tickets, Aaron uh, chipped in with a couple hundred of his own. So uh, the guys are really feeling their oats. They're feeling red hot. And last year's betting Bible for the Florida Derby was one of the most profitable that we did all year long. So head to racingdudes.com. Get that. It is $39.95. You buy it on its own. It's free with any monthly subscription, including the Sambo Bombs put together by this guy right here, Mike Samich. So you can get those from him over at racingdudes.com as well. And I know over on v you're a little busy covering college basketball. Yeah, we got something called the NCAA tournament going on. We got four games tonight, four tomorrow, and we head into the Elite Eight. Uh, I'll be out in Vegas to do the show from 9 a.m. to noon Pacific. Yeah, 9 a.m. to noon Pacific, noon to 3 Eastern, Saturday and Sunday over on VSIN, giving all the best bets out across college basketball, the NHL. Now we got MLB going, so we got some MLB bets going. We're already 1 0 on the season. What could go wrong from there? Uh, <laughs> do like North Carolina tonight. That's that's one of my favorite plays tonight, laying yep. the four with North Carolina. I took the seven and a half with Clemson. Um, I also kind of like the under a little bit in San Diego State and UConn, but should be a fun night. I'm excited to see these like Elite Eight and Sweet 16 matchups because no matter who wins tonight and tomorrow, we're going to have phenomenal Elite Eight games. And uh, all four of my Final Four teams are live. So I threw, nice. in, a little, threw in a little parlay as well. Uh, currently paying 60 to 1. If UConn, North Carolina, Duke, and Tennessee make the Final Four, those are my Final Four teams. So I put a little 60 to 1 parlay in with the four of them to each win their region. Hell yeah, let's get that one home. That's awesome. And hopefully we help you get home some tickets at Gulfstream Park this Saturday. Again, go to racingnews.com for the inside. Gosh, it's not the inside track anymore. It's the betting Bible. It's been a betting Bible for over a year. The betting Bible for the Florida Derby available at racingnews.com. Follow us on Twitter. I'm at Curtis Kellerward. He is at Bomb 18 number one, number eight. Corporate overlords at racing underscore dudes. If you're watching live in just a couple of minutes, Dude 2 Bet Sports is going to be live with Aaron and Papa Dude covering College basketball, uh, sweets, every, picking every Sweet 16 game, and then previewing the Arkansas Derby. So if you want some Arkansas Derby talk, tune into that one. And then Blinkers Off later this evening. All the Derby preps, including the UAE Derby, which, Mike, for us is 6.50 in the morning, 6.50 in the morning Saturday. So somebody's going to need to tell me how it goes because I'm, I'm not watching that early. Just bet it, bet it Friday night and uh, see how much Forever Young paid to win. Boom, there you go. I love it. Forever Young to win the UAE Derby. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be back next Monday to talk about all the fun from horse racing. But until then, I'm Magic. And I'm Mike. Good luck this weekend. Maybe. 
The Magic Mike Show, where you hear the experts speak. The Magic Mike Show, tune into the show every week. The Magic Mike Show, you can trust the show is the bomb because it's being brought to you by RacingDudes.com.